We've done a weird thing with sex as a society. We've both elevated it, we've idolized it, and we've de-elevated it and demeaned it. Uh, we've made it kind of just a, a physical act, when in fact it's, it's more than that. And the reality is that we have to find that kind of middle ground as God teaches it to understand what sex is and how it is that it's supposed to be experienced and enjoyed. Hi, I'm Craig, and uh, I love answering difficult questions with Bible-driven truth. Uh, today we're going to talk about the question, uh, is premarital sex a bad idea or a good idea, right? And, and the answer, I think, is that the Bible teaches this. The Bible teaches that God invented sex, but he intended sex to be experienced and enjoyed in a committed marriage, a lifelong committed marriage between a man and a woman. And by the way, I think it's important to understand that uh, I said not just experienced, but also enjoyed. See, God actually intended sex to be something that we enjoy. Sometimes the church is sort of guilty of making sex seem like a dirty thing, uh, but the reality is that it's a good thing God created and he intended us to experience it and enjoy it. In fact, there's an entire book of the Bible called the Song of Solomon that really is, it's a pretty racy book. And a lot of people are surprised to find that it's in there and it clearly communicates that God intended sex to be enjoyed when it's in its right context, which is a lifelong committed marriage, okay? See, see here's the problem, any good thing becomes a bad thing when it's taken outside of its intended context, right? And so you can think of almost anything that's good and you can go, well, but if I use it in a way it was never intended to be used, it actually becomes a bad thing, a harmful thing. And I believe premarital sex is that exactly. It's a good thing taken outside of its context and it becomes a bad thing. So here's the thing about sex. Sex is more than a physical act. Uh, sometimes, actually, I should probably say, we've done a weird thing with sex in the modern world. We've both elevated it and de-elevated it. We've both sort of exalted it and made an idol out of it. In fact, I think there are a lot of people that really believe that sex is almost the highest expression of being human, and they can't imagine anything worse than somebody not experiencing sex for whatever reason, right? But at the same time, we've also de-elevated it. We've made it purely a physical act, and I don't believe that's the case. Uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, in in, uh, in the first couple chapters when God creates human beings, he says an interesting thing. He says that uh, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and different translations say it differently, but an old translation says, and cleave unto his wife or be joined to his wife. And, and actually, I believe that joining word that is being uh, used there is a description of sex. He's saying that a man and a woman come together and they, they join together. And, and sex isn't just a physical act. It's not just a physical thing that happens. It's actually a joining together physically, obviously, but I actually believe there's a spiritual component to sexuality. And when we have sex with somebody, we're actually joining together with them sort of body and soul on some level. And, and because of that, um, there there's a, there, the Bible uses this word cleave unto, and we don't use that language anymore. I think the best analogy is a, uh, if you remember, this is almost an old analogy. It's uh, the, the envelope, you know, you know how that top has that little sticky thing and you kind of lick it and then you stick it down. Uh, once that's stuck down and once it's dried, like those things are cleaved together, okay? Uh, you can't take them off without damage being done, okay? Something gets ripped if you open that. It's not a post-it note, okay? Post-it notes you can peel off all day long and there's no damage done to anything. And the interesting thing is we, we treat sex a lot like a post-it note. I can just have it and then peel off and go have it with somebody else, peel it off, have it with somebody else. There's no damage being done. That's how we think. But in reality, sex is more like licking the back of an envelope. There's an actual joining together that happens and when that's done with multiple people, it actually causes a little bit of a loss every time that that happens. And so I believe people are actually diminished in their, uh, in, in, in their souls, in their bodies, in their relational qualities uh, by having sex with multiple people. In the context of marriage, it's awesome though, because it's actually one of the things that bonds a husband and a wife together and keeps them close. It's, it's part of that bonding experience. Actually, in the, uh, the letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul actually tells people, you should not be depriving each other of sex, except for a very short period uh, by mutual agreement for, for spiritual purposes. So, you know, it can be kind of like a, a fasting from sex for a short period if both people agree to it. But other than that, he says, don't deprive each other. Having sex is important for a couple because, again, it's a bonding experience. Okay, but here's what happens is that when we, when we use sex outside of its context, it becomes a negative thing on several different levels. Uh, first, it's negative because it's, it's a sin. 
Um, and I didn't lead with that, not because I don't think that it's, it's not a sin, but because I wanted to help us understand what sex is before we understand why it's, it's a sin. So here's the thing. Since God invented sex and said, here's the context supposed to be enjoyed in, when we say, hey, thanks for inventing sex, God, but I think I'm going to take it from here. I'll have sex in my own, you know, my own, my own decisions and my own conduct, wherever I want to. That's a rebellion against God, okay? It, it, and, and by its definition, that, that's what sin is. It's saying to God, hey, thanks for what you've given me, but I'm going to take it from here. I'm going to do it according to my own sort of preferences, okay? So it's definitely a sin, and that's one of the problems because it separates us from God then. And, and so when we're using sex in the way God doesn't intend, it actually takes us farther away from God because it's an act of rebellion, and certainly that's a harmful thing. Uh, second, though, it's a harmful thing because, it, like I said, it bonds us to other people that we're not married to, and because that's not a permanent bond, uh, and we're going to have it with multiple people before marriage, it actually can diminish us, and, and that becomes a thing that, that can become really difficult later on in marriage, which leads me to a third just super practical downside of premarital sex is that uh, when you do get married, if you do get married, uh, you have a bunch of other people you've had sex with that you're comparing sex with your spouse to. And here's the thing, uh, comparison is the enemy of contentment. Being content in that marriage is, is actually lessened by having premarital sexual partners because there's a comparison uh, that you're making, whether you're doing it intentionally or unconsciously, and that's a negative thing. And so those are several reasons why I think why God says, no, here, it's a good thing, enjoy it, but enjoy it in the context that I created, which is a lifelong committed marriage between a man and a woman. So kind of a follow-up to the question about premarital sex in general, uh, here's a question that I get quite a bit. Um, in the ancient world, people got married a whole lot earlier, right? Right at the beginning of adolescence. So they were 12, 13, and they got married, and so they're 12, 13, and they're able to have sex. Uh, today, the average age of marriage, I think the last time I saw it's like 29, 30. So people are not getting married for quite a long time. So let's say you go into puberty at 12, you don't get married till you're like, 32 maybe, which is not uncommon now, that's a 20 year gap where you're ready to have sex, like biologically, you're like, let's go. And it's 20 years before you actually can have sex according to uh, what the Bible seems to teach about how God intended it to be experienced and enjoyed, which is in the context of marriage. What, what am I supposed to do during those 20 years? Isn't that an unrealistic expectation? So, so a couple things there. One of them, um, if, if you heard my last question and answer on sex in general, you may remember I said that uh, we've done this weird thing. We've elevated and de-elevated sex. We, we've elevated and oh, it's, it's this really, really important thing and, and like the worst thing you could do to somebody is not allow them to have sex. And then we've de-elevated making it just a biological action. And the reality is that it, it's somewhere in between. But partly because we've elevated it so high, um, the idea that somebody would be called to chastity, which is not experiencing sex, almost feels cruel, right? Uh, but that's because of that sort of over-elevation of the significance of sex. And, and God's plan for anybody who's not in a committed, lifelong marriage is actually abstinence. And as a modern society, we can't kind of grab a hold of that because it's not just that there's the biological urge to have sex, but there's almost this, almost this spiritual sense that, yeah, but we want somebody to be fulfilled and sexuality is so fulfilling. So if you're not letting them have sex or if you're not encouraging them to have sex or if you're discouraging it or whatever, then you're actually sort of like you're, you're working against their experience of fulfillment and how could you be so cruel? And we just have to rethink that, okay? Sex is not the highest experience of human existence. It's just not. And then there's this other issue too that I'm gonna say is that I, I think we're getting married too late. I, I really do. I think the fact that we're biological ready for sex, biologically ready for sex 12 or 13 suggests that we probably shouldn't be waiting 20 years to get married. Um, and, and I actually think there's all kinds of studies that show that later marriages are causing a certain level of problem in our society. Um, and so I, I'm actually a pretty big fan of marriage in general, partially because God invented it. A lot of it is because it's been such a powerful thing in my life and I've seen it be so powerful in other people's lives. So I think marriage is a really great thing and I don't think we should be waiting quite so long to experience it. Um, and, and that would help alleviate some of this problem of sort of putting off sex until marriage, if, if marriage came earlier, then sex would come earlier. We wouldn't have to deal with this long period biological struggle. So there's a couple of things that I think we need to kind of wrestle with as a society, especially as, as churches, as we think about sex and this, uh, the gap between I'm ready for sex, but I'm not supposed to be experiencing it because I'm not married yet. Yeah.
Hey, hey, just real quick, uh, we've been talking about sexuality as God intended it to be experienced and enjoyed, and I'm just really mindful and sensitive to the fact that as I've been talking about this, you might be going, that's not how I did it. Uh, I did it in a way that's not what God intended. I've had premarital sex, maybe I've had extramarital sex. Uh, you know, I, I enjoyed sex and experienced it outside of the context you're talking about, so um, is there any hope for me? And I want you to hear it very, very clearly. What you've done is sin, okay? It's not sex as God intended it, and that's sin, it's rebellion. But it's sin like we've all done. We, we've all committed sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all lived in ways that are not God's intention. It's not worse sin than anybody else's sin, okay? And here's the great news. All sin is forgivable, okay? Jesus loves you so much that he came and he died on the cross to pay for your sin, your sexual sin, your relational sin, every sin that we've ever committed, Jesus died for. And so even though you may not have experienced or enjoyed sex in the way God intended, God still loves you and he has forgiveness for you. And a relationship with God is still on the table if you'll just turn to him in faith by trusting in what Jesus did on the cross. Nothing you've done in your past needs to affect your present with God.